And it just kind of felt like to me, I was like, wow, it's so broken. You know, this modern search for love, like, you know, love is not an algorithm, right? Like that's not how it works. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks 2, where my guest today is Lisa Unger. Many of you remember she was with us again last year because I've been a longtime fan of her work since Beautiful Lies, novel back in 2006. So she returned goes, as guest today as we're going to talk about her 19th novel, Last Girl Ghosted. So welcome, Lisa. So glad to have you here. Thank you for having me, Carol. I always love talking to you. And you have that great setup. You're a great yeah. setting. Thank I always you. love it. I, I just want to see if your dogs and make a little walking appearance on the couch. Yeah, you know? he's about to do that. If you can see him over here stretching, getting ready to make his appearance on camera oh no he just flopped down over there anyway he'll be up yeah. soon he'll I'm be sure. he'll be up he'll be over to kind of hang out with us <laughs> so let's start by you telling us about last girl ghosted i want to hear your pitch for this book yeah do you want just the plot pitch or you want a little bit of like where the idea came from and the whole um, thing let's do both how about okay. if we do both start with the plot pitch and then say where the idea came from well so so ren is a she's an advice columnist she comes from a dark and traumatic past, but she's built a life for herself. And, um, you know, she's friends that she loves. She has a job that she loves, but you know, she might be a little bit lonely and her best friend Jax kind of pushes her into the world of online dating. And at first it kind of doesn't go very well. You know, she has some underwhelming encounters. Um, and then she meets Adam and when she falls for him, she falls hard mm -hmm. and they have a whirlwind romance. And then after a, a particularly romantic night, he makes a request. He says, tell me something that you have never told anyone. And she does. And then the next day he's gone. Mm -hmm. His social media profiles are gone. His phone is disconnected. The place where she thought he lived is just a vacation rental. And it's really clear, really fast that Ren has been ghosted. Um, and when a private detective shows up looking for the man she thought she knew as Adam, she realizes that there are other women who were in love with him, other women that fell hard, but those women have all disappeared. So instead of just being grateful that maybe, you know, he didn't get what he wanted from her, she decides to chase his very dark digital trail into his past and her own. Mm -hmm. And that is Last Girl Ghosted. That is definitely Last Girl Ghosted. That's a great synopsis. And Thank you. with enough like little like a twist of like what happened, what was her dark past, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So okay. So I know you've been happily married for years and you don't spend time on dating sites. So <laughs> what sparked this idea? I mean, I'm sitting there like, wait, this she wasn't doing this recently, folks. I know this. You know? <laughs> No, I haven't been doing it recently, but I did have a very, um, I did have a very interesting converse, conversation with a young friend of mine, and she was talking about her experiences with the with the dating apps, and she said, you know, there's just this endless pool of choices, you know, and you just keep swiping and swiping, and then there's the next one and the next one, and you just, you know, she wondered, how do you ever know if you pick the right person? Mm -hmm. And then she said, if somebody shows up in your life and they don't really measure up to what you thought you were going to get when you saw them in, you know, on the app or in social media or whatever, it's just so easy to ghost that person mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. end communication and never, ever see him again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she thought like, I, um, this conversation stayed with me and it just kind of felt like to me, I was like, wow, it's so broken. You know, this modern search for love, like, you know, love is not an algorithm, right? Like that's not how it works. And so it's more like a head trip. And so, you know, how do you ever allow yourself to find love in this like really inorganic way that people are meeting and what they feel, how they feel about choices. And so like that just kind of, that just kind of stayed with me. And that was sort of the germ, the initial seed that led me to start doing a lot of research about online dating. And one of the things that kind of stuck with me in the research was that, you know, like once upon a time, the, your pool of choices was very, very small. Mm -hmm. You know, you just had your town 
at one point, you know, mm -hmm. your family, the families that your family knew, maybe your church later, at, you know, with the rise of agriculture, towns got bigger, cities formed, you had bigger, bigger pools, bigger pools, and then, you know, enter the internet, and all of a sudden, you have a, you have, you know, a global pool of people to choose from. And, you know, those expectations of what you were going to get when you went on a date with somebody, they went from being like relatively limited, like courtship, marriage to like, whatever, right? Like, whatever, <laughs> whatever you happen to want, you can find it on, yeah. online. And then at the end of it, you know, you don't really have a close tie connection to somebody. So if you ghost them, you know, there's no external reason to treat people well. You're not going to wind up sitting next to your Tinder dates grandmother at church on Sunday. You know, you have to answer for the fact that you ghosted, you know, your grand her granddaughter or whatever. And so it just felt like, you know, this this like technology in general, it makes it masquerades as connecting us. Like we think we're so connected. And in mm -hmm. fact, we're less, less connected than ever. You know, those, mm -hmm. those, those connections are loose and they can be severed without any effort, really. Mm -hmm. And I remember like people, if you weren't married when you got out of college, it was harder right. to find somebody. It, mm -hmm. And it still is today. If you leave college and you've been in that pool. And I remember my last night of college realizing that was the last time I was going to live with all my friends in the same building. Yes. That was the last time. It was like our version of friends, but earlier. And right. you just go upstairs and you could have a no shoes, no socks relationship with somebody because right. you didn't go up down the elevator. Exactly. And then you leave and okay, who are there? There's the pool of your high school friends when you right. go home. And then when you start working, it's the pool of people you meet there. But it's a lot more difficult. It's mm -hmm. it's not like you know when our parents were growing up that you married somebody from three blocks away or whatever. Right. And now when you open this all up, it's. I mean, my younger son is always telling me, "Oh, I met this girl." And then the next week, I ask him, "Cause ah, not talking to her anymore." But he says, "You know, ghost him." I just sit there and say, "This this isn't going to be. This isn't going to work." But right. We spent a lot of time investing in this swiping business back and forth and having these initial conversations before you even go out with somebody that may or may not work out you know yeah and you go out to a bar if you go out to a bar now if you i don't know if you've been in a bar lately carol like hanging out probably not um but even like pre-pan even pre-pandemic you yeah. know if you were to go to a bar you the chances of you looking at or a nightclub you look around at people where we all used to go out to bars and clubs to meet each other everybody you are looking at is doing this yeah <laughs> or they're doing this yeah, on the dance floor right like they're not even looking at each other right like they're <laughs> looking at themselves in their phone and broadcasting that out for other people who are not there to see meanwhile they're not connecting with the people that are right in front of them and it's, it's really funny. It's, it's really funny, funny. Yeah. We went to, went to see Paul Simon a couple of years ago and the people three rows in front of us had their backs to the stage the entire time filming themselves with him in the background and they're uploading these pictures. I was like, can you be in the moment you even here? at all? And everybody was like, you know, posturing and this, that, the other thing. And I was just there. Mm -hmm. It's the craziest, craziest, crazy thing. Everyone is on camera all day long making making their lives. I it's, know. It's very strange. It's very strange. Yeah. And I mean, this is a theme that has run through a lot of the books. I mean, it's definitely a theme that I touch on in Confessions on the 745 mm -hmm. as well. It's like, this is how is technology, and this is an ongoing obsession for me. It's how is technology changing the way we relate to each other? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's what, you know, that's what books are about. You know, all, all my plot flows from characters. So books are about people. And, you know, so there's this, this, I, you know, and people are about relationships, people are about their connections to each other, you know, and so like, how is technology changing the way we relate to each other and it's changing it, you know, in ways that I don't think we even understand yet. Mm -mm. We yeah. perfectly sculpted lives like no one's child cries on Instagram, nobody ever is upset everybody's always happy. Right, it's curated. Is, yeah, curated. Yeah. Everybody's running. I feel like there's like a play that's happening all day long. Enter act one of my life, enter act two of my life. Right. No one burns dinner. No one does this. I mean, somebody put up at one point, you see this child, this is a child that was screaming in the hallway 15 minutes ago. And you're right. just, because no one cries, no babies cry. I mean, you have to have really difficult self-image problems, but even if you're dating, oh, so-and-so is seeing so-and-so and people have fabricated who they are, but they're mm -hmm. falling 
like, you know, right and left. I love that the name of the way of the dating a website is Torch. And how long did it take to come up with that name? Was it a blank in the manuscript for a while? Because no, Torch. it was immediately Torch. It was immediately. it was it was immediately Torch. I don't know. I don't even know why. I don't even holding a torch for the other torch. Holding a torch, a flame, you know, something like that. Like that. I think that's what it was. But that was that was immediately immediately what it was. Yeah. Right there, right there. Right there. So then, okay, so now we have another unusual name with Ren. So oh, where yeah. did this name come from? It's- well, this, is, this came up last night in a talk um, at Murder by the Book. And, you know, it kind of threw me for a loop for a second because I, I didn't know the answer. I still kind of don't know the answer because a lot of times, I mean, most of the time, I feel like my characters just come with their name. Mm-hmm. Like there is no process by which I choose names. Like I know some people are like, oh, I have a baby book or you know, whatever it is, but that, that never, that never is the way it works for me. They, they come with their name. And I think that Ren, and then also, you know, without saying too much about the book, her childhood friend, Robin, and that name, it all kind of stems from my ongoing obsession with birds. Like I just obsessed with birds. Like I just want to know as much as I can about them. (laughs) And you know, there's a bird theme that kind of you know, that if you look closely enough at the, at the books, it kind of, it, or really it's birds in nature. It's that, that's the, a theme that runs through most, most of the books. And so I feel like that was an extension of my, uh, my bird obsession. And I just love, I love that name because it's just, it just seems to me like it's beautiful and somehow strong, somehow powerful. Um, and so that's, I think, what maybe why it resonated with me. And I felt it was childlike to me as well. There was a childlike, um, when I saw the name, that's the thing that crossed my mind is like a baby yeah. wren. It wasn't somebody that was big, it was a baby wren. Right. And somebody to be right. cared for. Mm-hmm. So mm. Adam definitely harkened back to me of Adam and Eve. Mm. And Adam being, mm-hmm, yeah, Adam being the first guy and the guy that she's like with. So just goes up to you, I just want you to know I'm full biblical there. When I saw Adam, I was like, what is Adam? Adam's the person that tempts Eve. Adam is the person who this. So oh, girl, just that's know, very I went really deep on your book, you know? <laughs> really deep. Wow. You can use that tomorrow. It's okay. I will. I'm going to use that. I'm going to write that. Let me write that down so I can use it when they ask me tomorrow another question. Yeah. And then. <laughs> Jax is both Ren's caretaker and her motivator. So it's her friend, yes. but yes. it's the person saying, no, don't do this. And the person who's checking in on her all the time, the person right. who's worrying about her all the time. And I feel like people need somebody, especially somebody vulnerable like Ren to take right. care of her. And Jax gets that role. And I really loved her in that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I loved her too. I, and I have to say that, you know, I do write about female friendships a lot because I feel like the women in my life are, you know, they they're rock stars, you know, like I have some incredibly powerful, successful, uh, funny, sweet, kind, engaged female friends, like people who I really count on and who I know really count on me to like, kind of haul you through the, you know, cheer you through the good days and haul you through the bad ones, you know, and I feel like this is something that we don't ever look at so much. And I think, I think Ren even says it in the story. It's like, everybody's always looking for love, but nobody ever spends a, you know, spends any time thinking about like these deep female relationships that mm-hmm. sustain you for a lot of your life. Like I have friends that I've had since I was in the eighth grade and friends I've had since I was 18 and like these relationships you know, whether you wind up not talking to somebody for a while or losing touch and reconnecting, like these relationships, you know, are um, like, they define you in some way, like these female relationships. And I feel like even in my career, like every, every advantage, every leg up, every mentor, every person who I really look to, um, you know, for support has, has been a woman. And so I think that that's kind of an important thing to, you know, to reflect on. Mm-hmm. And definitely do that looking at Jax because it's, she's um, worrying about her here, but she's pushing her head here. Try this, do that, pull back right. here. Wait, why and are you doing she's tracking that? her on the app. Where are you? What are you doing? Am I going to learn about you on a podcast? I'm coming after you. Like, you know, just that kind of humor and like also knowing, you know, knowing her, knowing her tendencies, like why, you know, knowing her destructive tendencies and trying to help her to be her best self without any of that undercurrent that, you know, you so often see in fiction and 
um, you know, that undercurrent of like, you know, you can, women can't be trusted or, you know, we're not good to each other or we betray each other. And I, I personally have not found that to be true. And uh, I, I want to, I want to reflect a different kind of relationship in, in the books. Yeah. Somebody's going to be there for you and push mm-hmm. you at the same time. So you quote, let me see if I can get this right. Rainier Maria Rilke. Oh, Rilke? Rilke? Rain, uh, Rainer Rilke. Yes. Okay. Yes. A number of times in the book. Okay. What prompted the selection of her and her poetry? It's a, um, it's a, it's a man and he yeah. is a long, he's a, a, just a long time favorite of mine. Um, it's just, um, his poems are just very, they're very deep and very meaningful. And so I have like a slight obsession with him, the same as I do with Carl Jung. So you might see Rilke in various ways in a lot of my books, the same way you'll see like Carl Jung stuff, but you know, his, his poetry is, you know, it's very dark and beautiful. It's very tapped into something um, deep and wise, um, and really they're his love, le- they're most often pulled upon to talk about, you know, love and how we love each other, but actually they're his love letters to God. They're his on con- ongoing conversation with God and the universe about what he's experiencing in the world and what he feels and what he wants. And it's, they're just, they're, you know, they're filled with a kind of a, you know, like this mingling of, I think, wisdom and and longing and just an understanding of the force of the of the universe and all the things that shape our lives and so it's it's somebody that I come back to again and again as as a reader do you spend a lot of time reading poetry and have you written any I well as a kid of course you know I wrote a a ton of like terrible you know maudlin teen angst (laughs) And some rhyme. Well, of course, course. my sure, God. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I don't. I don't read that much poetry, actually, and I, I don't write any poetry. But when I do find, um, you know, something that resonates with me, it, it really does resonate. Like, uh, like I think, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, so- songs are poetry. Mm-hmm. Music is a big part of my process. And you know, um, as a young right, as a young writer and a young reader, I I was influenced by by poetry. Yeah. So did you actually go back and find the passages that you wanted to put in or were they already in your head of what you wanted? A lot of them are already knocking around my, a lot of them are already knocking around my head, but I did actually, I did have the book near me when, uh, when I was, when I was reading. And also right. copy editing. When you were copy editing, it was like, wait a second, did that really went the way? Is that, that right? Did was? I get it right? Did I get it right? Cause you always want to make sure you get it exactly right. You always want to mm-hmm. make sure you have the line, especially with poetry, you have the line breaks mm-hmm. where they're meant to be like, you don't want to, you don't want to defile the poetry you've got to do your you've got to do your copy editing copy editing is not sexy but it is important very it's important, so important. Readers don't notice how many times you read that book for copy editing they have no, no idea you yeah have- even even at the last at the last final copy editing on this book which usually it's like nothing there was like you know all of these like queries at the end of it I was like oh my god like thank god for this person <laughs> I did, write the, I did write the book during a pandemic you know yes yeah. and so it was like you know I guess I in a lot of ways I don't think I I mean because writing is always like an escape hatch for me it's where I go to metabolize darkness right so I did a lot of writing during the pandemic like that is like my place where I go and uh but I think in a lot of ways I didn't I didn't really um fully acknowledge the impact that it had on me. I certainly didn't recognize the impact that it had on the book Mm -hmm. until I was reading it, you know, in my editorial phase and was like, wow, okay, this is really dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, (laughs) oh, are we going to survive? Are we going to get from point A to point B? And it was all the tricks along the way. And it was exactly where we were last year. But then we've got ba- uh, Bailey Kirk who comes on the scene and all of Ren's thoughts about Adam are upended. Like, 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 wow. you know. I mean, she didn't know him that long. You know, I mean, this, this is one of the things we talked about last night at Murder by the Book. She was, uh, Sarah was asking about, you know, the, um, how she speaks to him. The whole book is she's talk she's talking to him. She doesn't really forget about it because she's telling him about the story like in her in this way and you know I guess uh, you know she felt you know like she is like 
this kind of she's very young you know mm -hmm. and she was very lonely and she's very like kind of cocooned like kind of wrapped up in this world that she created right she's wealthy right. she's you know she's successful she's able to create a, a safe space for herself right and then all of a sudden she comes out and she gives herself over to somebody right in this in this way and she um you know she um is fragile in that way you know like she she gave some she gave more of herself than probably most most people would have and she thought more of those three months that she had with him than maybe because it's not that long no, but to, her, to her it felt like that it felt like it was no and she felt like this but she felt like she really knew him and then she starts unraveling that how much right. she really doesn't know right how she go to a place and i don't want to give anything away because it's fun for the reader to discover what right she doesn't know along the way that she right. was so and, real and as and, she finds out more about him then of course you know she's not you know she's not self-destructive necessarily so of course as she realizes more about him and we're not going to say what she finds out about him but as she starts to peel back his layers all the things that he had, then, you know, obviously it becomes less easy to, to love, to love him mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the way that she thought if she ever did really love him. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, whatever affection or relationship or whatever right. she had with him is completely upended as she starts yes. to realize the lie that was built around her. Right. And exactly. And it is really crazy when you see all the things that happen that we're not going to go into them. Okay. Right. So let's go to your description of language you use so well. And I like when Ren thinks back to the place where she lived as a child and you use houses are like people, they have memories and energy. Hmm. So talk to us about what writing about place figures into your work because you describe yeah. place so well. You can see where she is in so many places along the way. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, like as as I, we've said many times before, like all plot for me flows from character, but place is i think sort of part of character it's where it's what you chose or in the case of your origin your home of origin it's what you were uh given and mm -hmm. it for and it forms you the place where you were you know where you were raised it kind of it kind of forms you, your family of origin the region, the place where you were. And so that's always very sort of important to me. Um, of course, the hollows is its own thing. You know, that's like my sort of fictional town. And it is always conspiring to kind of get into every book. Like it just <laughs> wants to be in every book. You know, it just, I don't know why. I don't want it in every book, but it wants to be in every book. So it keeps trying to find its way. And in this case, we found ourselves in the hollows again and i was just like it was not planned it was not planned to see some of those characters again but you know there they were and i was like well you know i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna influence it like if this is where we are this is where we are and so i feel even though that place is fictional and even that home even the home where where Ren grew up these are fictional places like there's just something about that place or you know both of those places that really just ignited my um you know, it, there's like a familiarity, like a, just a connection that I feel that I, you know, like, I feel like I'm there when I'm right, when I'm writing about it. And so I take in all that sense, um, you know, all the, you, employing all the senses to make you feel like you're there as well. And so I think that that might be part of it, but place is always very important. Like New York city, I write about a lot, you know, that's where you know, I, I come from that region and I spend a lot of time there. And in many ways, I feel like that's the place that I know better than anything. Maybe not like specifically right now, but like the essence of whatever it is I took with me. Same with the hollow, same with, you know, Ren's childhood home, same even with the the graveyard that she's, she's in for a time like that. You know, I can feel those places. I can smell them. I can hear them. You know, and so I just employ all of that when I'm trying to reveal it on the page. Well, let me just put on my shrink hat. And once we're during the pandemic, we have to yes. go to familiar places. She right. wasn't going to LA. Like she wasn't getting on a plane last right. year. You had to go some places she could drive. I mean, think about where your head was. Yeah, when you were exactly. And yeah, you're not going on a plane, right? You're not going to change, right? Exactly. That's what I was locked down. So I guess she was too, but I was not, mm -hmm. not intentionally. Mm -hmm. But no, yeah. that's, that's where yeah. it like, you know, drove, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
the dark web is also so interesting and oh, people yeah. may not know that actually exists. And yeah, tell me about how you found in your research that, I mean, there, there are many times where you can go incognito, like you want to go look at a site and my son yeah. goes, Let's go incognito. And I'm like, I, yeah, nobody- it's very weird. And, and it's not, it's not bad. I mean, the, so the, the dark web can only be accessed from a specific router called Tor. Mm-hmm. Sure. I think there are other, I think there are other ones now as well. But, you know, it's just kind of this weird, like, it's really just this kind of weird nether world. And I think most people don't know that it exists um, or don't really know that much about it. And I only know, you know, like a surface amount of stuff about it, you know, but I always, you know, anytime I can find something to read about it, I'm always researching it because it's very interesting. But, you know, there just are these, you know, there's all these, um, there's a really interesting book. Oh, my gosh, what was it called? Um Oh, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to email it to you. Mm-hmm. It was a, it's about disappear. It's a it's about disappearing, about how to disappear, mm-hmm. and it's about this. Um, it's about what the author calls uh, pseudocide, like when you fake your su- when you fake your suicide for whatever yeah. various reasons, or when you're trying to disappear. And in that mm-hmm. book, it was a nonfiction book, and she was talking about it because she um, she was like in this weird place in her life where you know, she had graduated from college. She was drowning in debt. She couldn't, she couldn't get a job. You know, her parents didn't have any money. Like, so there was no like support from her parents or anything like that. And she was just like thinking to herself, how am I going to get out from under this? And like, wouldn't it be just be better if I was like dead, but like dead, Mm -hmm. you know, like gone right? Like, so I could get out, change my identity and get out from under all this debt. And so this idea led her to, um, led her to start, um, you know, researching all the different ways people fake their own deaths. And in this book, I, I read about this kind of guy who is like a fixer. He's mm-hmm. an internet fixer. And you would find somebody like him on the dark web. You could also probably find like a hitman. You could find a prostitute. You could buy drugs. You can get guns. You can, you know, like in the, you can't, it's not traced in the way that now, you know, as well as I do, if you were to go on Amazon and look for a gun, <laughs> Yeah, you would you would get ads that. for guns yeah. Yeah. all day long, right? The dark web that that doesn't happen. You're not being tracked in that in that same way. So I guess there's like some kind of a, a freedom to that, you know. And you can use different modes of payment like Bitcoin and and stuff like that. But anyway, this guy, the internet fixer, he actually could help you create a profile for yourself Mm -hmm. and he could go so far as to if there were things about you online that were unsavory or things that you didn't want to still be out there he has a way not of removing those things but of flooding your what your search what you search for flooding that with all new information, all different kinds of information about you so that the thing that you're trying to hide gets buried beneath, you know, the, the, the new stuff. And so I found that so fascinating. And, um, that just, that also kicked around in my head for a while. And it kind of surfaced in this book. I wasn't sure what, like I read all, I'm like a nonfiction junkie, you know, just read and read and read. So I, I, you know, I never know where things are, where research is like a continuum. I never know where things are going to turn up. Right. Where they're going to come back. And so like I often thought about that on 9-11 and watching the coverage even 20 years, 20 years later is who just disappeared that day? Who just said like, right. it was a moment that can just disappear. And right. if you're going to find my DNA, it's okay. Because there's right. a lot of people that are going to find, I just had that really big thought. And it's like, do you talk about their moments, plane crashes, things like that, The people, people could just, it. I'm not there. It wasn't me. I was, I'm, I'm gone. And yeah. Just, and I think yeah. a lot of people, I think a lot of like more people walk away from their lives than are taken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not a crime to walk away from your life. It's not a crime to nobody's going to follow you unless you faked your own death and defrauded an insurance company. Then they're coming after you, I promise. And they are going to find you, no doubt. Right. But unless you, if you just walked away from your life and you didn't leave anything behind and you didn't hurt anyone and you didn't, um, you know, you didn't steal anything, then nobody's, nobody's coming to look for you. They're not coming after you. They're not coming after you at all. 
Mm-mm. No. And the books celebrate se- separate into sections. Um, did you have those from the start? And I think I've got them all. I've ghosted, rewilding, I am the storm. I'm not sure if there's a fourth. I just didn't see, but I saw three. I think there's three. I think there's three. Okay, good. <laughs> I was like looking today. Oh, no, I, like, I oh, just no. wrote it. I just. <laughs> I just wrote the book. I don't know if there's sections, okay. Carol. <laughs> me, you know? That's another one of those copy editing things. Did you have a favorite character to write? Was there one that you really loved the best? And one that was who is the trickiest? Um, you know, I always love all my I always loved dwelling with all my characters. I really loved I I really loved Ren. I loved my time with her. Mm-hmm. I love Robin. Um, you know, I love the idea of her, like that's some, another, I, that's another theme that without getting into what, you know, what she is, that's another theme that kind of runs through some of my work at these friends that are, um, I don't know, exist on another level, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so I, um, you know, like I'm, I'm always very interested in that. I really loved Bailey. Mm-hmm. You know, I really loved getting to know him because he, when he turned up, I just didn't know what he was going to be doing. I didn't know if he was you know, not bad. I didn't know if he was going to be dangerous well, takes, or threatening. And he takes risks with his own life to continue to follow the story. I mean, he yeah. walks away from something because they said, like, we're not supporting this. Like, you've got to go out. You're on your own at this point. Right. And- like, you, nobody's paying you anymore. You've got to, you know, but he starts to feel, you know, something for Ren. And, you know, he has his own agenda that he's running like he's got his own like sort of in you know interior obsessions Mm -hmm. you know about finding things that are lost and not letting you know not letting somebody get away so that they can hurt somebody else so he's got his own he's got his all his own stuff going on his own agendas his own agendas and yeah like and is he damaged in any way that you have to find out as time goes on like what's going on with him right like what's going on with him what what formed him you know, what makes him this way. And yeah, he was really, he was really interesting. He's probably, I guess in some ways, he's probably my least dark Mm -hmm. character Mm -hmm. yet. Yeah. In some ways he's got, you know, he's got his, he's got the things that formed him, but he was formed in love. You know, he was formed in a, in a strong, strong, positive family, not perfect, you know, certainly issues, but, um, yeah, and I think that there probably aren't that many Jacks too. She's probably like my least dark character. She's got, you know, she can't, even though, you know, she's a, she's a single mom. Her mom is very present and, you know, powerful in her life and stuff. And so, you know, she's, um, you know, and, and she brings that light to the book. She brings that light to the book and she brings that light to, to Ren, mm-hmm. you know, that love. I have a question. Did you ever think about having, like when you were writing the book, was there ever a moment where there were two girls that were both his victims that were alive talking to each other and then one disappears? Did that ever enter that one of these past women that had you know, been a victim of Adams? Was, she, was there ever a moment where you thought about the two of them hanging out with each other and the woman disappears or no? I didn't, I didn't think about that, but that's, yeah. I like that. Yeah, because I was just thinking, when <laughs> so last girl ghosted, I thought that she would have connected with somebody who was before and just said, what about him? Mm. And have that person tell the story. I don't know. I'm like rewriting the book, but that's no, well, thank you. That's, a, that's, that's good <laughs> advice. I'll, I'll, I'll take that into consideration uh, next time I'm writing. <laughs> no, it's just really funny because a lot of times people will sit there and say, I was with him also like, yeah. Oh, that same thing to you and blah, blah, blah. And I always think that's kind of right. interesting. Because well, I had this caring. like sort of, I had this idea, like sort of like, you know, the way the book kind of evolved. I mean, the book books always evolved in ways that I don't expect them to evolve. And one of the things that I had, you know, early on thought about this, about this book was that I want, I wanted to have the perspectives of the women who are missing. Like I wanted the book to be more about them. Mm-hmm. So I wanted the book to be more about Ren and her journey and the other women as well. I wanted you to see inside their, um, you know, their worlds a little bit. And I wanted it to be more about that than it was about him. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he, I wanted it to, that I wanted the story, he, he you know, he's, he's, you know, obviously he has his layers, he's running his agenda, he has his, you know, story as well. But to me, his story 
is not as important as the story of the women who are 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 missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, the women are missing, and why are they missing, and when were they missing? And why are you, and this is another thing that kind of comes up again and again, why are some, you know, what makes one person a predator and what makes another person the prey? Mm -hmm. What is it, 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 is there darkness in you that like sort of punches a hole in the universe, right? That allows more darkness to flow through. Like when you are the victim of trauma, are you more vulnerable to darkness? So Mm -hmm. that's something that comes up for me again and again, the work, you know, just that question of what, like, what allows us to mistake, um, you know, darkness for love. Mm -hmm. And because they were trained, those people were trained, what, this is the way your life was. And it's like, you don't, you don't know light because you've known dark so much. You've known people not treating you well, so treating you well becomes such a crazy thing. Right. And even when she's sitting down and she's talking to um, Bailey and she's having conversations with him, he's ordering the same drink as her. And she's going, right. what does that mean? Why is he doing that? This is happening. Why is he doing that? And she's right. always constantly thinking, right. there's got to be an agenda here on what you're doing. It can't yeah. just be you're doing it because, oh, that sounded interesting. I'm going to drink it too. Yeah. And if you're not raised in abuse, if you're not raised in abuse, you don't think that way. If you're mm-hmm. not raised by an abuser, so, you know, and this is the other thing, this is kind of, this came up in confessions and it comes up a lot. Like people who grow up in abuse, like they're, they're watchers. Mm-hmm. They watch other people's faces, their actions. They're always trying to interpret, you know, they want to, and they're doing that because they're trying to keep themselves safe. They're mm-hmm. used to being in the thrall of somebody who's unpredictable, somebody who's frightening, somebody who's not trustworthy, somebody who was supposed to be taking care of them. And in fact, did quite the opposite. Mm-hmm. And so if they survived, they survived that because they were watchers because mm-hmm. they were able, I, I see the change in expression on your face. I hear the tone. I hear the shift of tone in your voice. I know this, even Ren was very attuned to her father. Like, even if he gets too happy, Mm -hmm. there's a problem, you Mm -hmm. know, there could be a problem, you know, any exuberance that takes you off the the baseline leaves you unstable. And so she, she carries that with her. I mean, her father is very, you know, obviously again, without getting into it, he's, um, you know, he's very unstable, unpredictable, Mm -hmm. dangerous, dangerous man. And she's used to an unhinged world as a result. That's right. So that anything that looks like, I mean, I could see her grasping for somebody like Adam who shows interest in her. Right. So, oh, he's showing interest in me. Well, then I feel really great about him because, mm-hmm. and she can hone in like him. Right. And he knows he's playing that. He's playing that card the whole time. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. So was this always the title? Was it always Last Girl Ghosted or, or was no. it was it something? No, it wasn't Last Girl Ghosted. I can't even remember what the title was now. <laughs> yeah, it's great though the way they did it. I really like the way yeah, they did it. I, I love it. Yeah, I think That's this cool. is my, well, Confessions on the 745 was my editor's title. Okay. The original title for Confessions on the 745 was uh, Black Butterfly. Oh, Confessions on the 745 is better. Okay. Uh, it's way better, way better. Um, and Last Girl Ghosted, I cannot remember. My editor is going to be super happy to hear me say that I cannot remember <laughs> what my original title was. The one I was the one I was fighting for and lying down for. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like I was, it has to be this. I would not accept another title. I can't remember what it was. It wasn't <laughs> as good as that. Let's put it that way. And I think it's, I like this think twice before you swipe. I was like, oh yes. All right. That should be like the logo that's going up on Instagram on people's pages. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Think twice before you swipe. Think twice before you decide what you're going to do. The UK publisher did a really cool, um, they did a really cool video. If you get a chance to go dig around for it, it looks, it looks really cool, but they, they made a play on that as well. Oh, Okay, yeah. great. We, we'll go try and try and find that. We'll make a note. Austin, our producer, will make a note and go find that. And you'll yeah. want to see the name of that book also. Um, yes, I just be like right. Oh, don't worry about it. We can. It'll be a reason for somebody to read the show notes. It's be in there. Yes, I will remember it and and send to you. I, it's right on the tip of my brain. All right, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Um, Vivian Laney is the one who narrates the audio. 
And she also did Confessions on the 745. Is she a favorite narrator of yours? She is. Yeah, I absolutely love her. She, I love her voice. And then we, um, I was at um, Unlikely Story, which is Jeff Kenny's store in mm-hmm. Plainville, Mass. And she lives nearby and she came to my book signing. Oh. And I got to meet her and she's so, she's so wonderful. I just absolutely love her. And um, she's just a great narrator. And uh, she just really breathes another dimension into the audiobook. And I think everybody just really loves her. I think there's um, a lot of uh, just love for the renditions that she's created of the, of the novels. Yeah, she really does a great job. So do you spend a lot of time listening to audiobooks? I don't. I don't listen to audiobooks that much. I don't have like a ton of time like that. Like I don't have a commute or a drive. I do listen to podcasts. And stuff like that, but I don't listen um, that much to to audiobooks. No, last year we were listening to one in the car when you know March 2020, and mm. we got in the car in about June, and the, we were back on my my son goes, they're still lost, like really, all these months later, and I was like, no, we haven't turned on the radio. <laughs> I said, we drive so few miles right now that we could go six weeks on a tank of gas. I pride myself on that. <laughs> exactly. We haven't been to a gas station in six months. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I guess I should do that. And I used to be the one because we do four trips to New York in my car and we'd have to fill up the tank. Right. So it was always like, we only, went, we only went in four days a week. So every weekend I was like, oh, we're on like E. My husband right. goes, ever think about putting gas in i'm like honestly no i, really I know this is the conversation that i have this must be the conversation that every husband and wife has like whoever is like the person that's responsible for the gas <laughs> right in our house it's jeff like he's responsible for anything outside the walls and that includes the car <laughs> yeah i'm like why is there no gas in this car and he's yeah. like there is i'm like no there's not like i go we have 40 miles left I'm completely right. He's like, you've got 40 miles, miles left. I'm like, no, that's empty. That's almost right. empty. Anything could happen in 40 miles. Well, there was one time we went into the city and I had done that. And I said, we have enough to get out of the city. I think it was like right around, I think we got in like something after 9 11. And literally the car ran out of gas because we saw it in traffic and they had to push right. it into one of those gas stations outside the Lincoln Tunnel. Right. And it's like, why? That's did my you- worst nightmare. And I said, well, I knew how many miles, but I didn't count on getting stuck in traffic. <laughs> like that was not. Right. Exactly. That is my point. Exactly. Especially even down here in Florida, like you don't know when you could randomly get caught in beach traffic and just be sitting there yep. and not get down to 40 miles. That's no, that's not cool, man. We have an interstate by us and there's times where most of the things I do are one exit away, like one exit this way, one exit that way. <laughs> but I never get on the interstate because, and last Friday we went someplace and I remember saying, they said it shut down. There was an accident. And I was like, oh my God, it would have been between the two places I had to go. And I've been there for right. four hours. Like, right. really? Exactly. So I would take yeah. the back road if I can right. possibly do it. You know? Yeah, me too. Me too. So I have one more thing. Your dedication in this book absolutely cracked me up. So I've got to read this. For Jennifer Manfred, because you were a total badass and the person I'd call if I needed to get rid of a body. So my question right now is, who is Jennifer? Because that has got to be, that just shows how carefully I read this book because I started right, you out with that. And I want you to know that I folded down that page, like right at the beginning, like that is folded down on page like here, because I always fold down pages in the galleys, you know, impossible. That's so, hilarious. And I told her that that's an incredibly high compliment <laughs> considering the people that I know who I really could call yeah. if I needed to hide <laughs> if I needed to hide a body but you know yeah Jen is like one of my very good friends and you know she's one of those female relationships that I'm talking I'm that we were just talking about like you know the the kind of friend that like cheers you through the bad you know through the great days and hauls you through the bad days and we're like you know raising our kids together and the whole thing and she just has the you know she just shares my kind of like dark sense of humor and like I never have to I never have to apologize for the things that I (laughs) said things that I say to her and she's always willing to listen to all of my obsessive thoughts about research like I you know we there's a we have a joke between us like like I was doing a little research (laughs) 
<laughs> and wind up having this really like really long like four day kind of ongoing you know 10 minute snippet conversations about whatever topic it happens to be that we're into and she's just a really good friend and uh i i just and we have this kind of running joke between us about like you know hey if you showed up to my if you showed up in my in my driveway with a body in your trunk, I'd help you get to Mexico kind of a thing. Like it's that kind of a friendship. So that was a, a nod to our, our, our abiding friendship. Here's what we're going to do. I just loved it. I just loved it. So just tell Jennifer, she got a shout out from me. Right from I'm going to tell her. She's going to be really what this is gonna be. So where are you on book number 20? Is book number 20 written? Is Yes. Worse? It is really? done. I, I just, I just finished it a couple of weeks ago and about to head into the editorial phase on that. Hopefully mm -hmm. after, <laughs> after the book tour, well, it's, 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 <laughs> not during a lot of times it's during I'm like on book tour and editing, but this time, um, it's, it's not quite as overlapped as it, as it usually is. So that's okay. And I'm, you know, we're already, you know, at work on the one that comes next. So wow. Wow. So this like, oh, this is like a really weird time of year for me where I'm promoting one book and I'm, you know, editing one at the another book. And I've already sort of, you know, I'm already being tugged in that other direction of the, the book that I want to write next. So I'm already have my voices and my thought and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I have to sit there the editor going, wait, which book? The one out? The next one? Like which one? I'm sorry, what are you talking about? Was the one in my head? It's the one in my head, the one on paper, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Linwood Barkley, I think, has got the right, best line about waiting for editorial comments. He said, it's like waiting for tests from the doctor. And he says, you just want to know, am just, I going to live? Just tell me. Just let me know, is this book alive or is this book dead? Because I just need to know. And he says, it, it really, when that news comes when you're on tour, it's like, no, 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 no. Can we just like- Oh, no, 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 not right now, not right now, exactly. I know, I have so many talk, so many stories about this, like being on vacation and then they like, oh God, <laughs> not me, but like friends of mine and like just, oh, uh, but you know, We're I think that- I think that the editorial process is, you know, most of the time it's an exciting process, you know, because I feel like for me, it's like where I, t like when I turn my book in, like, that's it. Like that, I got nothing. That's the best I can do. Like, literally, I have given every ounce of myself to that book. I have done, I have operated at the pinnacle of my ability. Like, I'm sorry, but that's the best. Like, this is the best I can do. Get. I got it. I'm, it's all. <laughs> it. Then you've got to show me that I've got more. Right. I'm and then your editor's like, but, and you're like, okay. And then, <laughs> yeah. and then it's like, that's where I feel like I take it from being the best that I could do to the best that it can be. And mm -hmm. I always find that very exciting. I always find that, you know, um, like a, you know, like a fun time, like an interesting right. time, you know, even though it's like, oh. But it's yeah. funny because so many times people say, I just got the editor's notes on Christmas Eve and they're due New Year's Day. <laughs> exactly. You're like, yeah, no Christmas for you. <laughs> no Christmas for you. You're rewriting. <laughs> You're fixing. Get back to work. <laughs> you, got your, you got your bad note from the doctor. Like, this is just not good. He, when he said that that time, he's just like waiting for test results from the doctor. Will I live while I die? I was like, <sighs> very, very good. Very, very good. Lisa, as always, it's fun. I wish oh, we could do it in person, but we haven't done that in a long time. But I know. We'll okay. see, and I'm sure we'll be together again. I'll make coffee. Yes. <laughs> we still have, our, she still hasn't let me forget the fact that I did not know how to make coffee the one time she came to my house. I did not. I, I have never brought it up. <laughs> nope. But my husband prepped everything, and all I did was hit the button. And awesome. then she, I said, if you want another cup, we'll have to go like, to the store. No. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Congratulations. Another terrific book. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To.